So I, our team, our basketball team, I played eighth grade basketball and I was um, probably a five one white dude. So I had NBA written all over me back in the day, right? And my dad wanted me to get ready for the season. My dad liked to drink back in the day, big time drinker. He's been sober a long time now, but my dad could drink. So my dad said, hey, eighth grade's coming up. You're playing some basketball because you sucked at football. We don't know where this baseball thing's going. You're playing basketball. I'm like, dad, I'm not sure genetically, DNA wise, I'm completely qualified to play basketball long term, but we'll do it. So my dad set a hoop up in the backyard, except when he set the hoop up, and I practiced every day, I'm telling you, every day the summer going into eighth grade, except my dad had had some drinks, like a lot of drinks the day that he set the hoop up, and he set it up a foot short, except I never knew that. So I just kept practicing and practicing and practicing on a, on a hoop that was a foot lower than it was supposed to be. So I got a shot you can't even believe from like nine and a half foot hoops, right? So basketball starts, tryouts, only eight guys try out, so I make the team. But I'm the eighth player. I'm eight. By like 80 spots, I'm eight, right? If we could have had the ladies play on the team, I'd have not made the team. So long story short, I don't play the first six games. I averaged for the season zero points and zero rebounds. Let me explain to you why I averaged zero. I did not score a basket the entire season in eighth grade. We're in the championship game against Lore Beer High School. Strep throat runs through our team. That night, I'm so excited because I get to go to my first baseball camp where there's gonna be perf- my mom and dad script and save, and we're gonna send me to a baseball camp. First baseball camp in my life. That was my love, that was my sport, and my dad had saved, so all I wanna do is go to baseball camp. And I went to school that day because I knew if I didn't go to school, my dad wouldn't let me go to baseball camp. And I also that day, I was so excited about it, I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but I was worried about playing baseball. Don't worry about this image, but I was worried that. I didn't know how to put my jock strap on correctly. So I went to school that day because baseball came. My dad wasn't going to make it home for it. So I had my dad show me how to put the jock. So I have no underwear on. I'm wearing a literal jock strap like our chaps with your butt cheeks hanging out the back. If you ladies don't know what I'm talking about. Okay. So it's like not a pretty thing. I wore that under my school clothes that day because of the baseball camp. Anyway, sixth period comes along, it's P.E. I don't go to P.E. because I got strep throat. And I t- my dad calls the school, he says, hey, your mom's telling me you're skipping a basketball game. It's the championship. I'm like, well, dad, I got strep throat. He goes, you don't get to go to baseball camp. You don't go to the damn finals of the basketball game. The best ability is availability. Can you picture my dad, right? I go, okay, dad. I'll go. The other two guys who are on the team don't go because they got strep. So now there's five dudes on the team. Guess who has to play in the championship game? Big guy right here. I put my sweats on. We drive to Lord Beer High School. Packed house. Our school. Their school. Cheerleaders. The band. I haven't scored all year. I never even really play. Everybody takes off their jumpsuits. I take off my jumpsuit. Run out. Get into the layup line. I'm in the layup line. It's a little chilly, but I'm still in the layup line. I run in the layup line. I run through, I get my first pass. Boom, brick the first layup. I'm running by, I'm hearing everybody laughing. And then my guys are like, oh my God, Eddie. And I'm like, what's up? And I look down and I have my shirt on, on my children, my shirt on and my jock strap and tennis shoes and socks. That's what I'm wearing. In the layup line, dead true story. Picture that, shoes, socks, Jock strap, tank top, break the first layup. And it was like, what? And I can hear the whole, whoa! Everyone's, look at this guy! Oh my God! And so I literally coach Lindsay, Ed Lindsay, get over here. And we run, and the whole team makes a circle around me. They're like, find him some shorts. Who's got some shorts? They find some shorts in the bag, and I put the damn shorts on. Can you imagine the terror of a little boy? The whole school saw it. The whole Chaparral Cougar school saw my ass in a jock strap. So I went the whole game. I went the whole game. Game, scored zero points. I got fouled with two seconds left in the game. We're down by one. I got two free throws. I can't get my damn mind off the jock strap horror film that took place about an hour ago. So on top of the jock strap, I airball the first free throw and I brick the second one and we lose the junior high championship on top of it. It was a bad day, man. It was a bad day, right? It's like something you would dream about that would literally actually never happen. To this day, you guys, I have nightmares when I'm at the gym. I always check. I always look down. I swear to you, middle of workouts, I'm like, okay, all right, got it. I'm always afraid. Why do I tell you that story? Because I'm about to tell you something that's going to change your life. That night, I went to baseball camp. The worst day of my life became the, one of the best days of my life. People ask me all the time, how do you think you became sort of a relatively confident guy with this great upbringing you had? Because I had a strong dad. And every time in my life that's come along, when there's a mentor that showed up, someone better than me that's ahead, God put him in my life and I took advantage of it. Whether that was Rich Thawley or Tony Robbins or various other people in my life. And this one man altered the direction of my life. I'm going to tell you about it. I went to baseball camp that night. 
night and it was called Angel Country Baseball Camp. And I used to bat like this with the bat really flat, like this, kind of just like this. Pitch would come in, boom. The bat was flat. And the reason I did that is my hero for the angels is a guy named Rod Carew. How I many of you know who Rod Carew is? You'll know in a minute if you don't. Rod Carew is a Hall of Fame baseball player. He played the wrong video. Hall of Fame baseball player, one of the greatest hitters of all time. And I'm in the cage, I'm hitting, I'm hitting like this. And behind me, I hear a man say, who's the little lefty? Who's the little lefty? And they go, oh, that's little Eddie. And I hear him talking and I hit another one. <laughs> Line drive up the middle. Line drive up the middle. Now, all I'm thinking about is what had happened to me that day. I'm still wearing the same jock strap, by the way. Okay? Line drive up the middle. Just one of those dream moments, right? And the guy goes, I like this kid's swing. And I look and they turn to the batting cage and guess who's standing there? Rod Carew, number 29. And he goes, hey kid, where'd you learn to hit like that? I said, oh my God. I said, I learned by watching you. He goes, let's hit a few more. And he stood at the great Rod Carew. Standing right there. He goes, let's hit a few more. He goes, I like your swing. He goes, flatten the bat out a little bit. Spread your right foot out. Open your toe. I'm going, that's Rod Crew. And he goes, you're good. You're really good. I think you could be a great player someday. And he didn't stop at that. He said, in fact, would you like me to work with you? I went, yes. He goes, well, here's what I do. When I'm in town on Tuesday nights, they come over to my cages and I work with about five, six guys just like you. I'd love to work with you. Can you be there next Tuesday? Uh, yes, sir. I could be there. And for the next five years of my life, my baseball mentor, my life mentor became Rod Carew. And I'd sit in the batting cage with Rod I'd sit in the cage with Rod, and he'd tell me exactly what to do. But on that, he goes, you're out working everybody, buddy. You're going to do something great someday. With your work ethic, you're going to do something great. You're going to be a great college player. Every Tuesday he was in town. Every Tuesday for years. And this man took this shy boy who had just had that experience in baseball over the next five years, constantly loved on me, constantly told me how great I was, constantly told me he believed it. And because of what a powerful example he was, when you have one of the five greatest hitters in the history of baseball tell you you're great, you believe it. And he didn't just make it about baseball. He made it about life and what a good boy I was. Now I got good grades and I treated my parents well. And what I found out about Rod is he's one of these special souls that I was one of thousands and thousands of children that he took an interest in, which is why when I graduated college, my first job was at a group home working with kids. I wanted to be just like Rod when my baseball career ended. He poured belief into me, confidence. I started to walk different, think different. I thought I was special. The power of mentors in your life who love you and believe in you. And Rod did this over and over and over again. And then many years after I knew Rod, I'm going to Elmo, his little daughter. This is how you sow seeds in your life. See, all these calls you're making, all the phone calls, all the contacts, they don't feel like it's paying off right now, but you're planting seeds like in the parable of the sower. The, the wind's going to get a few, the rain's going to get a few, the birds are going to get a few, but eventually there's a harvest in a way that you can't even imagine. And Rod, for years, in addition to being this great player, was a better man. Man. And he sowed seeds into kids over and over and over. A wonderful soul. He's from Panama. He wasn't even born here. He's a beautiful man. And then many years after I knew them, his little girl, Michelle, I became very close with. Michelle was a little five-year-old little girl that used to sit behind the cage with her mama and watch us every week. And when Michelle turned 16, she got leukemia. And she lost her battle with leukemia. When she was 16, at the time, it was a national story. This is April 18th, 1996. You're about to get blown away. April 18th, 1996, my great mentor, the man who believed in me that changed, how's a little dude like me end up playing baseball at that level because of that belief? How did I do well in business? Because right after Rod Carew came Rich Tholley and Tony Robbins, these people who believed in me. And so it says, Michelle Carew, the daughter of baseball Hall of Famer Rod Carew, who waged a seven-year battle with leukemia that sparked international outpouring of support and a surge in pool, listen, of potential donors died Wednesday morning. She was 18. Their family was destroyed. I want you to watch Rod's quote when it happened. This is 1996. I can't make this up. Although we have lost Michelle, we can take solace in the fact because of her, many lives have already been saved by the increase in marrow transplants performed in the week subsequent to our appeal because of donors. The usually taciturn Carew had pleaded for people across the country. This is 19. 1996 to sign up as potential donors donors remember that word donors when his daughter passes away he turned it into a victory worst day of his life became the best day of his life donors sowing seeds doesn't know when you're going to harvest it he has 
Uh, he, uh, he saw how few African Americans and other minorities were registered for the National Donor Program. Within a few weeks, he began a public awareness campaign after her death. More than 70,000 calls for donors were generated. Two million increase in donate and donors were made across the country. That's absolutely awesome, said Carew. It's the initiative we've been waiting for. And then it shows you that the hospital's personnel sobbed and exchanged hugs during the news conference. He took the news conference of her death and turned it into a donor drive. After that, he started a foundation called the 29 Foundation, after his baseball number. Do my job and handle my business. But I got that from back when I was staying out late at night. My ability to talk to large groups of people who I do not know come from me having to get out of so many lies I had got myself into that I became comfortable doing that business. So coming out here telling the truth, pretty easy. The fact that I could fight you at the drop of a dime back then comes in handy because now I'm a, I'm a Christian, but there's limits to it. So I don't, you know, you look, it's only so much I can take. Then after that, I'm, I'm you're going to get off of me. <laughs> It comes in handy because I'm busy. I don't have time for everybody. People stop me all the time. Steve, I need a picture. I need an autograph. I got, well, I'm going somewhere. All I want is a picture. I can't stop every time somebody want a picture. How would you like if everywhere you went, somebody stopped you and wanted a picture? How many picture requests I get a day? I can't think of a day somebody ain't asked me for a picture, asked me for something. How would you like it if you was just going somewhere and here come, and now y'all got video cameras. Y'all just pull them out and here they go. <laughs> Somebody films me every day and I'm not even where I just look over there and my boy go, man, step behind me. She over there filming. I get that every day. How would you like that? So being a former fighter, I was in the store the other day. Probably. Let me see if I can tell this. <laughs> Okay. I got off the plane. I came to Dallas yesterday. I, I get up and I'm in a stop in a store. We come from the airport. I got to get some water. I go in the store. This brother come up to me. He ain't got hardly all his teeth. He come up to me. He little muscular dude. He come up. Steve Harvey, what's up? So I say, hey man, how you doing? You ain't got no bodyguard? I'm 6'2". I weigh 235. Now, I ain't no bad man, but I, I used to box. So now you ain't got all your teeth. So you ain't real healthy. You have a little alcoholic aroma to you. I don't drink. So I figure we good. However this go, this going to be good. But it's because of what I was that God has changed. Now, it used to be I just turn around and start swinging. It'd be on and cracking. But now God changed that. But see, what it caused me to realize was I was who I was. But I am who I am. And I'm cool with both of them. So you've got to be willing to stay focused, to be creative, to be relentless, because things are going to happen to you when you're working on your dream, when you get on track. I remember when I first got involved in speaking, one of the main things that speakers like to do is speak to speak to a certain association that they have over 10,000 of their sales reps that come to this convention. And I was relentless. I kept saying, it's possible. It's possible. See, what I wanted to let you know and set you up for, because you said it's possible, don't mean that you're not going to have any problems. That Murphy's Law ain't gonna come and slap you side the head. Oh, Murphy gonna come visit you. He's waiting for some of y'all out in the parking lot. Oh, you say it's possible. Okay, it's possible. You better get up. Well, I was working. I kept saying it's possible. They got other speakers on this program. I can be on that program too. I kept selling myself. I got all fired up. And I was calling him every day, every day. And the lady finally said, Mr. Brown, I tell you what. We want you to come in and talk to our sales executives. You got the kind of fire and guts that they want that will motivate them. And let me tell you something else. We want you to bring your motivational tape. You're going to need at least $50,000 worth of tapes. I said, is that right? Yes, because they want to keep that drive alive. I said, all right. I called the guy to duplicate my tapes. I said, Don, how are you doing? This is less. Let me tell you, I got a major speaking engagement. I said, man, it's a speaker's dream. I need over $50,000 worth of product. 
He said, Les, you don't have that kind of credit. I said, I know, but Don, I can sell that. Just, just right after speaking engagement, I'll give you money in four days. He said, are you sure, Les? I said, yes, but I got a major speaking engagement and they told me to do it. He said, man, that, that's a big art. Let me talk with the lady with you. I said, hold on just a minute, man. Call the lady back. Hello, Evelyn, how you doing? This is Les Brown. I got Don on the phone. What did you say? Do I have the speaking engagement? Yes, you do. And, and what else you suggest? Les, our, our people, they buy a lot of tapes. Your tapes are very popular among them. I'm saying bring at least $50,000 worth of tapes left. You'll sell everything you got and more. I said, did you hear that, Don? He said, yes. I said, now, if anybody else has to make a decision, are you the final person? She said, I'm the final person. I will send you the contract. I want you. I said, you hear that, Don? He said, yes. I said, oh, ye of little faith. I said, duplicate the tapes, man. Hunk a photo. Well, he duplicate the tapes. One week, pain by. I'm checking the mail every day. No contract. I said, come on, Murphy. Don't start nothing. Come on, man. Give me a break. Come on. How you know? Say, fair. Come on, man. Give me a break. Come on. I talked to myself, you know? I didn't want to call him right then. Two weeks passed by. Murphy said, don't you think you ought to call him? I said, okay. I called. I said, hello. Uh, this is Les Brown calling. How you doing, Les? I said, fine. I said, um, Evelyn hasn't sent my contract out yet. Any additional information you need? So, Les, you haven't heard? I said, no. I said, Evelyn died. I said, she died? I said, did she say anything about me? When I got home, I was so wiped out. And Murphy was in the house waiting on me. Murphy said, is it possible you want to listen to some of your tapes? The spiritual part. I'm an amateur on the spiritual side. I do happen to believe that human beings are more than just an advanced life form, an advanced species of the animal kingdom. I do believe humans are a special creation. That's just my personal belief, and I don't ask you to buy it. But here's what I do ask you to buy. If you do believe in spirituality in any manner, here's my best advice. Study it and practice it. Do not neglect your values. Do not neglect your virtue. If you do believe in spirituality, my advice is study it and practice it. Don't let it go unstudied. Don't let it go unnourished. If you do believe, that's my best advice on the spiritual. Now here's the third part, the mental side. Part of this personal development challenge is to develop mentally. Learn, study, grow, change. It's what schooling is all about. And the human development takes time, incredible amounts of time. That's why we've taken the time for this seminar. It just takes time. Some things you can't cover in a 20 minute speak. You can't cover in a little five minute talk. It takes time. For humans, it takes seem like more time than any other life for a human being. The little wildebeest in Africa. Guess how much time it's got as soon as it's born to be able to run with the pack so it doesn't get eaten by the lions. Guess how much time it's got? A few minutes. As soon as the little wildebeest is born, tries to stand up, falls down. Its mother nudges it, gets stand back up, falls back down. Finally on little shaky legs, it tries to nurse. Mother pushes it away. She moves away so it can't nurse. Why, you can't nurse now, you gotta develop some strength now. The lions, the lions, the lions. Falls down, gets back up, tries to nurse, mother pushes it away. No, you gotta get these legs strong. How much time have we got? Not much time. Mama will be six. Not much time. Not hours, not days, minutes. Wow, but the human baby, wow. After 16 years, we're not sure. <laughs> Unbelievable amount of time it takes. So it does take time for personal development. It does take time for spiritual development, physical development. But here's also what takes time, and that's your mental development. Feeding the mind, nourishing the mind. Some people read so little, they got rickets of the mind. They couldn't give you a good strong argument as to their own personal belief. Here's one of the challenges we've got as parents, and that is to get our kids ready to debate the major life issues of the 90s. They've got to get ready to debate. We've spent this last couple of decades debating communism. Communism taught capital belongs in the hands of the state. We've been teaching, no, capital belongs in the hands of the people. Communism taught, people are too dumb and stupid to know what to do with capital. You've got to take capital away from all the dumb, stupid people and give it to the all-knowing, all-wise state. And let the state run everything and let the people meekly show up for their work assignment. All glory to the state, communism taught. Kid says, well, is that right? No, all glory to the people. Let the state be the servant of the people, not the people be the servant of the state. I'm telling you, you got to be able to pick up those ideologies. You got to be able to pick up the philosophy. And here's the next part. You got to be able to defend it. If you can't defend your virtues and if you can't defend your values, I'm telling you, even in the 90s, you'll fall prey to philosophies that are not in your best interest.
And we've got to help our teenagers. We've got to help our kids, especially, to be able to debate the major life issues, the political issues and the social issues and the religious issues and the spiritual issues and the nutritional issues and, and the economic issues and all of the rest of the issues that are valuable for us to build the kind of... Dear Vikas, listen to me, the price you pay for losing here is too extreme. You have to carry the burden of valuable the rest of your life that carry around with you. If you fail here, bigger then thing breaks my heart. If you feel the right opinion and write you back, those dreams, the streetless run, you and they start to sell it. You dream and you quite you give up you got to decide I'm going to win you got to failure part of caring failure you have been exposed to have could be if you fail here the price is extreme if you forever you carry the failure forever I am being honest you with you I meet people often time that say I was uh, you really change my life for meeting but and they they are hands down and they are crying crying their thesis Facebook and Instagram and that we are going to got to know you win got to sell yeah I am telling you got to become sell out you need to sell out you need to oversight you got to relevant you got to a road dog you got to license that you what you got to put you head down, you fail six, you window. I don't care if you brains now, you one of those rows you need six year. And right now I like best of you have feel from me now doing to 25 years I have failed. Had I have playing often again, you are selling the dream again. You can feel it, have you some sugar at the conversion, don't we feel? If you can see the video, we need your best. Let on sit down and see your family. And over some distant family, something but damned family, we always get along there of the day and done same thing together. Thank you for watching. Like, share, and subscribe.